what we think is probably the first genetics lesson combined with a live cello performance ever. <laughs> have think? any of you in the audience, put your hand up if you have ever seen genetics and cello together before. Dude, we got this. <laughs> like, there are no hands up. This is excellent. Totally original here. Uh, so I, of course, am a scientist, but I am a scientist who's really passionate about the arts. And similarly, Peter is an artist who's really engaged with the scientific community. And what we want to share with you today is the idea that science and art are not mutually exclusive endeavors, and that, in fact, the roots of art, the roots of culture and creativity, they actually stem from a very, very scientific place. Now, because I'm a scientist, we love empirical observations, I'm going to empirically observe two things here. First, I want you to direct your attention to Peter. Hello, Peter. So Hello. Peter is an excellent representative example of the species Homo sapiens sapiens. So unlike the other primates, Peter is capable of walking upright. He has a very, very big brain. He's got the capacity for language. Say hello, Peter. Hello. <laughs> you can say hello back to him. He came all the way from London to do this. Say hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. I told you Canadians were polite, Very especially friendly. Vancouver Very people. Friendly. Very friendly, I Very know. Friendly. And in addition to walking upright and having a very big brain and having the capacity for language, Peter also has the capacity to compose and to play music. Just like that, way better than I could do. Now, let's empirically observe something else. Let's empirically observe this. This is Pan Troglodytes, better known to you and I as the chimpanzee. Now, chimpanzees are humans' closest relatives on the evolutionary tree of life, yet there are so many things that separate us from them. You know, have you seen a chimpanzee on the stage playing a cello? That means no in cello. No, you have not. Have you seen paintings by a chimpanzee hanging in the Louvre? No. Maybe the Museum of Modern Art. Chimps are really good at abstract expressionism, but definitely not the Louvre. Can chimpanzees sit on the toilet and do differential equations out of a physics book like Victor Chan? No, of course they can't. They shit in the woods, and then they throw their feces at each other. <laughs> They haven't even invented toilets, but we managed to get that. We got that. Us humans, we are complex systems. Sometime since the six million years or so ago, when we diverged from chimpanzees and when we diverged from all of the other animals before that, we evolved complexity. We evolved culture, creativity, language, art, music. So the big biological question is, where are the origins of culture, of complexity, of creativity? Well, we have to look something or someplace primal. We have to look someplace that dates back to our earliest human ancestors who were painting horses on the walls of caves in France. We have to look for something universal, something that's present in each and every one of us, no matter where we live in the world, no matter what culture we belong to. We have to look for something that is passed down from generation to generation. We have to look for something like DNA. DNA is the alphabet of life. It's four letters representing chemical bases, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, that together form genes. These are basically the building blocks or the instructions for life. And we call the complete set of DNA instructions to make a living organism a genome. And every living thing on Earth has a genome. You have genomes, I have one, squirrels have them, cats have them, cellists have genomes. Everything has a genome. And there is some tantalizing evidence out there that the origins of culture lie in our genome. This is a zebra finch, or if you are British like Peter, a zebra finch. Now, male zebra finches, when they're raised in the wild, they learn a beautiful song from their fathers and from their uncles. Exactly like that. If you take a male zebra finch and you raise him in isolation so he never hears the songs of his fathers, the songs of his uncles, he will still grow up learning to sing a song, but it's a very different song. And that's the cello version. The bird version is way worse. <laughs> <laughs> 
shepherds are jerks. So this is, it's true. That's where all influenza virus comes from. I gotta warn you about that. So I gotta wear my infectious disease hat for a little bit. Anyway, this is where it gets really interesting. If you take one of these zebra finches with a horrible, squawky, awful song, and you let it have babies, and you raise those babies up, and raise them in isolation, they will still sing a squawky song, but it'll be a little better than their fathers. Now, if you take those zebra finches, that next generation, and you let them have babies, and you raise those babies in isolation, they will improve upon the song a little bit more. And very quickly, within just four or five generations, these male zebra finches that have only ever been raised in isolation, who have never heard natural bird song, well, their song sounds like this. Nicely done. They regained their song. It was in them all along. It was in their DNA. Now, in 2001, the human genome was sequenced, and scientists everywhere, myself included, were super excited to dive in and find what it was in the human genome that set us apart from other species, that set us apart from chimpanzees, that made us complex and creative and gave us language and art and music and all of those awesome things, including the ability to sit on the toilet and do differential equations. What was it? in our genome. And there were all these hypotheses floating around. So some people said, OK, well, we are the most successful, capable, complex species on Earth. Surely it is due to the fact that we are the species with the biggest genomes. We have the biggest instruction books. And the answer to that was no. <laughs> Sad trombone as interpreted on the cello. Uh, so we humans, we have genomes of about three billion letters. And that sounds like a lot of letters, and sure it is, but consider this. This is the marbled lungfish. Its genome is 133 billion letters long. It has 45 times the amount of DNA that we do, and it's just a fish. Like, it's a nice fish, it's got spots and stuff, but it's a fish. <laughs> So we had to go back to the drawing board, and we said, OK, if it's not the amount of DNA in our genome, maybe it's the number of genes that we have. Maybe we take those three billion letters, and we split them up into tens and tens and tens and thousands of genes. And you probably know where this is going. The answer to that, too, was no. <laughs> Wah, wah, indeed. This was actually one of the most interesting aspects of the Human Genome Project. Scientists were thinking that humans probably had 50,000, 60,000, maybe even 100,000 genes because we're so complex. But when the final count came in, 21,000 genes. Now, there's an organism on this Earth that has 99,000 genes in its genome. It has five times as many genes, five times as many building blocks as we do. What could it be? Is it something awesome like a gorilla or a dolphin or something cool? No. It's a single-celled parasite, Trichomonas vaginalis. From its last name, I think you can guess where it lives. <laughs> yeah. The organism with the most genes of anything on this planet is an STD. <laughs> its sole purpose in life is making you itchy in your pants. <laughs> it's not the amount of DNA. It's not the number of genes that we have. So what is it? What could it possibly be that imparts this complexity? Well, the answer is junk. More specifically, junk DNA. Now, let me explain. I have a little demo here. So if you were to take all of the DNA in one single cell, one single cell, and unravel it, it's about this much. It's about 1.8 meters. I'm short, so I'm going to have to lift this up. Now, let me get my little scissors out of my pocket here. Always bring scissors to a talk. If you come to the party after, I'll be giving up free haircuts. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> So 1.8 meters of DNA in each cell. Now, remember I told you humans have 21,000 genes. Well, those 21,000 genes, they take up 
this much. They take up about four centimeters. So what's the deal with this pile of string on the ground? What's the deal with the other 98% of our genome that we had no idea about? Scientists, when we're confronted with something we don't understand, our natural tendency is just to sort of ignore it and push it aside like this. And that's what we did in this case. We called this junk DNA. We figured it was just bits and pieces of sort of genetic cosmic debris that we've been picking up and hoarding over millions and millions of years of evolution. No function whatsoever. And then a few years ago, our perspective tilted. And as it turns out, this previously unloved junk DNA is actually quite important. It contains thousands and thousands of regulatory elements. They're not genes themselves, but they modify the behavior of the genes. That's right. By influencing where and when and how our genes are expressed, these regulatory elements in the junk DNA, which we've now respectfully renamed to non-coding DNA, these regulatory elements massively extend the potential of our 21,000 genes. They impart the complexity that makes us human. They are the reason we and other species that have fewer of these elements, they're the reason that we have culture, we have creativity and language and music. And if you look at these elements and you look at them quite closely, you'll see it's a string of letters behind us. And they repeat and they're in sequences and they kind of move around, not unlike music. So to bring it to life and to make it make sense to someone like me, um, Jennifer and I were having cocktails in London, as you do, because it was a Tuesday. And <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really matter what day of the week it is. I think it was a Tuesday. I think anyway, it was a Tuesday. And, um, well, for cocktails. Yes. Every day. And we were talking about this. Jen was explaining to me what this meant, and I wasn't understanding it. And so we sort of thought, well, what better way of doing that than sort of a highly visceral thing, something that someone like me would understand. Let's listen to it. Right. Now, to do that, we had to take these repetitive elements and visualize their locations along the human chromosomes. You have 23 chromosomes, and this is what the data looks like for one of those chromosomes. We picked 17 to show you because it's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> what you see on this graph, the x-axis is the length of the chromosome. So it starts at the left and it finishes on the right. Each row, each of those little gray lines, is one of the repetitive elements in the human genome. They're uh, noted by little database identifiers there. The blue squares indicate where along the length of the chromosome that repeat element occurs, and the blue lines indicate the intervals between those repeat elements. So turning data into music is a process called data sonification. It's not new, it's not flashy, it's quite clever, but uh, it's not new. And in fact, people have actually turned DNA into music before. The issue is it kind of sounds a bit like a fire in a pet shop or you know, a symphony for squeaky gates. It's, like, it's not very satisfying, it's not very interesting, and it's, from a kind of stupid point of view, it's not very engaging. It doesn't give you a good um, route into the, the data, into the information. So we thought, why don't we take a leaf out of the book of our data visualization colleagues? Now, we've all seen hundreds of beautiful data visualizations. You know, newspapers are full of them, Wired exists for them. And they just sort of, they're beautiful because they, they have these artists that put a, an aesthetic layer in front of the data. It's not cheating, it's not untruthful, it's not dis, uh, disingenuous. It's just a kind of an attractive way of packaging the information. So we thought, why not turn DNA into something beautiful sounding? Now to do that, as you can see from chromosome 17, that starts to look a little bit like musical notation. It starts to look a little bit like a score, so someone like me can get playing with it. So what we did was assign pitches to each of the vertical rings on the, rungs on the ladder. Uh, that's this aesthetic layer that we're talking about. So there are different pitches for each vertical line, and then horizontally, it's divided into one beat a second, or 60 beats per minute. Uh, so it's then divided up into a grid, and we can then get a sense of pulse and a sense of placement for these notes, uh, which I think we can yeah. hear. Yeah, let's see if the audio works. Follow the bouncing ball. Ta-da!
Now, the justification for something like this is quite simple. If you imagine you're doing a painting, you know, you're painting a, a landscape or a portrait, it doesn't matter what you're painting. If you use all of your colors all at once, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to be brown sludge. So we decided that we wanted this to be quite kind of pointed and beautiful and, and nice. So then we, we chose the notes that we were going to use, as you just heard there on the piano. But music isn't just about the notes that we play. It's not just about tunes and, and harmony. It's about the space between the notes. That's what makes it mean something. That's what gives it that kind of gravitas and emotion. Now, to do that, what we did was we looked at the, some of those repeating letter sequences, which are called stop codons. And they're the repeating three letters of A, C, G, and T. That's the right order. You're learning. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm using learning. <laughs> and so um, the repeating sequences, A, C, G, and T, and each one then um, is assigned to a different rhythm, again, on that 60 beats per minute grid. And instead of just having a kind of stop, as the name might suggest, what we did was we kind of sucked a little bit of air out of it and covered it in reverb, which is a little bit like pouring gravy on stuff or putting sugar on things. It just makes everything better. Um, <laughs> so we covered it in reverb so that it felt more musical and more kind of um, listenable. I'm the one that has to play this stuff, so you're going to have to indulge me. Um, so we can play this now. I think. Nope. Oh, no, we can't. Come back. Here we go. Now, everything that we've shown you so far is based on rules. We're generating a melody from the genetic code. We're generating a rhythm from uh, the sequence of the DNA that we're looking at. But the thing in biology is that it doesn't always play by the rules. And in fact, a couple of years ago, science discovered a whole other layer of regulation in the genome. And it's one that's not actually encoded within the sequence in itself. Instead, the environment that we grow up in, that we're exposed to, can actually change our genes by physically modifying the structure of DNA. This is something called epigenetics. So what you've got is your genome, uh, its genes, its regulatory elements, essentially setting the ground rules to make a human. And then nature, through these epigenetic mechanisms, can kind of play over top of that. It takes a little bit of artistic license. So for the very final layer in our composition, we have Peter playing a freeform cello melody over top of the hard-coded melody, the hard-coded rhythm that was dictated by the DNA sequence. Thank you very much. Thank you.